I'm going to start this presentation with talking to you about something that has nothing to do with healthcare. And that is what you see on the screen right now is a picture of an orange car, pretty ugly orange car. It's called a Ford Pinto. And what happened with the Ford Pinto is it was sent out into the public in mass quantities. It was very, it was very popular because it was a compact car and many people bought it. But there was a design flaw. And that design flaw was if you were traveling and someone rear-ended you, it would engulf the entire car in flames. And so there was multiple fatalities across the country where people were killed because of this design flaw in the gas tank design of this car. During that time, the Ford Motor Company became aware that under those circumstances, if someone rear-ended that car, that people would be killed and they had a meeting. And in the meeting, they talked about changing the uh, entire design or changing that one part of it, which was going to cost them about $11 to change that one part that would make this car safer. But as they multiplied that across how many cars there were out there, they realized it was going to cost them quite a bit of money, whereas if they just waited for the lawsuits for those people that died, it would cost them less. And this was well publicized, you can go out and Google it, that this decision made far from the front line of driving was to allow people to be harmed instead of changing a known design or a software or a failure. So today I'm going to talk to you about tubing misconnections and I'm going to show you where I believe we've come to the same decision. And although it may not be well understood, my hope is when you walk away from this, that you will be an advocate for this change as well. I have no commercial financial relationships to disclose. Um, these opinions on this presentation are just my own. And I wanted to just acknowledge that Brian Patel, who's retired from the VA Patient Safety Center, and Peggy Gunter from Aspen, as well as Nancy Pratt, were very much instrumental in putting this work together. So in many ICUs across the country, and certainly in NICUs, this is certainly what you see. You see very ill children, very ill adults, hooked to many different physiologic monitoring systems that maintain their ther therapies that we give them that deliver drugs, that uh, allow us to sample for arterial gases, that allow us to give them pain relief through epidurals or central venous catheters, or gastrostomy tubes where we can give them feeding. The fatal flaw that we find here is that each one of these connectors, if you look at the end of it, has what is termed in the industry a small bore connector or a lure lock. And when you think about it, from the pragmatic standpoint, logical standpoint, it makes sense that all these things connect together so we can devise these tubing systems so they all work and we can put them in place for therapies, we can put them in place for the benefit of the patient. But the fact that they all do connect to each other is really the fatal flaw that we have in this system. And I'd like to show you the research work that we've done uh, around this and why we've come to this conclusion. My work with tubing misconnections started back in 2005. Uh, at that time, I investigated an error that looked much like that slide that I just showed you, where a child was in an ICU unit, a NICU. Um, the nurse taking care of that child was a 15-year veteran of that unit, was the preceptor on the unit, was the nurse that you wanted taking care of the sickest of patients. And she misconnected the feeding line to the IV line in a very sick child. And during the investigation, we started looking into published literature and said, how can this happen? We started looking at, has it ever happened before? And what we found was the first case that was in published literature was in Lancet in 1972. And what you have before you on the slide is a timeline that goes well up into um, the present information that we have on tubing misconnections. In, two, in 72, there was a case in Lancet. That was a feeding tube to an IV line. We had international and national standards calls for changes in 79. 
we had case reports over and over again in the literature. And one thing that I think it's important for you to understand when you look at this is that in healthcare, we don't publish when we have a medical error. We usually typically don't because of all the legal things that go along with that. So that you would find these cases in the literature should be a rarity, but it was not. We saw it over and over again. When you look back before 2000, you see the safety company, ECRI, putting out an alert that this is a design flaw. You see ISMP calling for a redesign of blood pressure cuffs, which also connect to lure locks, asking that that was change as well, because we had people that were being connected from their uh, blood pressure cuff to an IV line, pumping them full of air. We had case reports of ventilators, especially of tracheostomy tubes, where you've got the port there that's a lure lock, and people would accidentally put the IV line to that lure lock. And then when we get to 2000 and we start looking at all the safety work around it, I want you to notice how frequently this starts to be reported, and how many different organizations start to say, this is a design flaw. We have a problem here. These physiologically incompatible systems should not be able to connect to each other. The Institute of Safe Medication Practices coming on board, sending many alerts out there, ECRI again, and the FDA, as well as the Joint Commission saying, it is time that we change this in healthcare. We published in 2011 uh, case reports of all of those cases that we could find in published literature that had to do with feeding tubes that were misconnected to intravenous line. We found 116 at that time. There are more now. We found that adults, there were about 60, children 30, and they didn't specify in some of the cases. And I want you to look here at what the results of a tubing misconnection is. Because these are physiologically incompatible systems, where if you connect one to the other, you cause a fatality, because they will not connect safely. We found that there was hypersensitivity, uh, coagulopathies, there were certainly neurologic damage in many of these cases, respiratory arrest, hypoxia, and death in that. So it, there is no question at all. If you are going to put a liquid into a respiratory system, you will cause harm. If you're going to put a feeding into an IV system, you will cause harm. And the real problem starts to get exponentially worse when we consider how many systems in healthcare rely on these universally fitting lure connectors. I've listed a few here for you. Intrathecal systems, gastrointestinal systems, driving gases, all your pneumatic compression devices for um, prevention of DVTs have lure connectors. Automatic non-invasive blood pressure cuffs, we've seen many of those where people accidentally connected that blood pressure cuff that would pump air into a patient as it cycled into the IV line. Intravenous systems, respiratory systems, ventilators, and all of your cardiovascular systems when you look at it. Um, the ones that have to do with arterial, hemodynamic monitoring, and venous monitoring. So this is a problem that is ubiquitous. It is across healthcare. It is in multiple settings. It's not just in acute care. We also find it in ambulatory surgical cases, and we find it in homes because people are getting feedings at home or getting IV therapy at home. And certainly, very tragically, many of these cases where you find that there's misconnections and there's a death happen in the home where either the patient or the mother of a child uh, misconnected those tubings inadvertently. This is an uh, actual picture of the first case that I investigated where an IV tubing was connected to an NG tube. And I want you to look at these red arrows here because it makes it very clear that a syringe would connect to the IV tubing and also it would connect to the NG tube feeding. And this again is the problem, is that there is no design preventing you from making these connections. Interestingly enough, uh, any other industry that I have gone to and shown them this design and said, what do you do when something's critical, such as in the nuclear industry, they have systems that should never connect to each other. He said, what do you do when you've got that? And what they told me was, we design it so you can't connect it. 
much like you can't put diesel in your car. You want to design it where you cannot connect things that would be fatal if they were connected because we know that human performance will not allow us to do 100% perfect care at all times. And actually there's a science behind this. It is human factors, the science of safety and of human performance, where we know that humans make predictable errors and they make them in predictable ways. The way that we believe that this is happening is what is called automatic mode and that's a slip. So in automatic mode, when you have a slip, and I want you to think about the ways that you've made a mistake before, you have an error that occurs during a familiar action. It's something that you do perfectly many times during the day. You're able to do it correctly because you know how to do it. But just like anything else that you do, you have a little trip where you miss one step. So these are actions that are governed by familiar, familiarity. You know, it's like me pouring my coffee every morning. It's like me locking my door. And often, have you ever walked away from your house and said, oh, I don't know if I locked the door or not. It's because this is so familiar to you that your brain doesn't spend that time holding your attention to that act. So we find that slips happen all the time. They happen to people that usually do it perfectly. Everyone has locked their keys into their car at one point. Everyone has dialed a wrong number. You know, I, dial my mother, I used to dial my mother all the time before I got an iPhone and now it's programmed and I would dial her number and I wouldn't even think about the number I was dialing because I did it all the time. So once in a while I dialed the wrong number or getting really busy and putting the milk in the cabinet and the cereal in the refrigerator. All these things are things where your attention is pulled away on one critical step. Automatic mode errors are well studied. We know much about them. We know um, how they happen, and we know predictably how often they'll happen. And we know they will happen more when you have more stress in the environment, whether it's physical or mental stress, or you have other distractions in the environment. So the more that you've got going on that your attention is drawn to that, then you're going to be spending your time thinking about something else, and you will miss it. So we know a lot about automatic mode errors. We know that they are caused by a change in the way that your attention is taken for your brain. So your brain only has limited capacity and it will spend attention where it is captured. In automatic mode errors, we know that usually these are familiar things and they're effortless and rapid for you because you've done them so many times. And what happens is there's a failure of that action to go as intended. So they, they occur in common and familiar functions and familiar surroundings. And this is the very sad thing about it. They're usually not detected by the participant. You won't know that you've made this error until you are that error is called to your attention, until someone actually points out that error. So these are not detected by the participant. And this is why I believe that it happens that people make this misconnection and then they, re they don't realize they've made it until the patient gets in trouble. Um, often too, when you go back, if you're doing a root cause analysis or you're looking at this error and trying to figure out what happens, if you go to that participant, the person that did that error, that was there and misconnected those and ask them, they won't remember, which is tragic and sad for people that try so hard to do a good job. We see this in other places in healthcare, and we have actually changed the design to accommodate it in other areas of healthcare. If you think about it, we used to have what we call free flow IV tubing, where you could let the entire bag of fluid just run right through the system. We also have designed needleless systems, where you take the needle and you pull that needle back in rather than try to recap it or try to um, manipulate it in some way, because we know people get needle sticks. Uh, if you look at that red container there, you see that white collar around the top? That is to prevent people from putting a sharp in there and then accidentally putting their hand too far and getting stuck. So these are what I would call design features for safety. On the left-hand side, you can see there is an IV tubing and there is a blood pressure cuff tubing. Both of those are designed with lower locks. 
So both of those could be connected very easily. And we have seen that before with disastrous results. You know, error, no matter what we want to say about our own performance, and no matter how much we train and we try, we have to recognize that error is an inevitable because of our human performance limitations. We have limited memory capacity. We had limited ability to think about many things at a time. Although we try to multitask, we find that it has negative consequences. We get stressed, we have tunnel vision when we have stress, and we have negative influences of our physiology. So if you're coming down with the flu, if you're starting to get a headache, if you haven't eaten, if you need to go to the bathroom, all of these things will take your attention away. So we also have flawed teamwork. So often we are doing these very critical tasks by ourselves. At the end of the day, we began to realize as all this research began to come forward that connecting tubing should be considered a high-risk activity. Much like when I first started ICU nursing, we used to give heparin and we used to never check it. We just gave it. Now we have double checks on heparin. We gave insulin. We didn't check it. Now we know it's so critical that we need to double check it. We must do the same thing with tubing. Knowing that those infusion and monitoring systems are physiologically incompatible, so you can't come back from this error. If you misconnect a feeding tube to an IV line, you have delivered a critical and fatal dose of feeding to that patient. These systems rely all on that single universal connector. So these routine tasks that are so familiar to us become the possibility of a fatality for a patient. This was publicized um, in the New York Times in 2010. They discussed uh, cases that happened in the United States. This is one where Chloe Back was in an ICU unit and she actually got part of a feeding through an IV line. She suffers from seizures today still because of that error. And it also told the story of Robin. Robin was a young woman who had hyperemesis gravidarum. So all through her pregnancy, she was throwing up. And you even see the, the IV tubing in the back. She was terribly dehydrated, and she needed feeding. So she was doing home therapy. She was towards the ends of her pregnancy. She was almost ready to deliver. But she got so dehydrated at home that they hospitalized her. So Robin went to the hospital. Um, she left behind her three-year-old her first baby and went to be stabilized in the hospital and an experienced nurse while Robin was there accidentally connected the feeding to her IV line. Her mother was there, Glenda who's an experienced OB nurse and together they watched as the unborn baby died from the feeding going through the intravenous system. Robin then began to be short of breath and her mother recognized what was wrong. You know, at that point, the feeding was already in the IV line. There was no way to come back from this error. And Robin died, leaving her child behind and her dead baby. So the question before you today is, why make this change? And I'd like for you to ask, for your, ask yourself, who endorses this change? And what you can do is you can say, without a doubt, every major safety organization in healthcare has said this needs to change. The FDA has been behind it, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, ECRI, the American Nurses Association passed a resolution for this change. So the facts are this, we know without a doubt this is a safety hazard that is going to lead to a patient death. We know it is present in every healthcare setting. We know that every safety organization has endorsed the change, and we know we have been aware of this for over 10 years, but we have not changed it in healthcare to date. We know people are still dying from this error. The cases still keep happening. We know there is no reason to tolerate this any longer. Any practitioner who is at 100% performance 
could make this error easily, and it has to change. So the question becomes, what is the holdup? Why is it not changed? Well, this year, it should change. The standard has changed. There is a holdup with the supply of the new connectors, and we have to make intelligent decisions about how we roll this out in healthcare for the safety of our patients. We need coordinated efforts from the vendors for this change. They have gone through ISO standards, they've gone through uh, the AAMI standards that can, for these connectors, and they have come to a new design. They need to endorse it and put it in the healthcare settings so we can deliver the safe care that we promise our patients. The important thing for you who are clinical people to, under, to think about, and as clinicians to really consider is this. We have a Ford Pinto here. We have a design that we know is unsafe. It's not unsafe all the time, but under certain circumstances, it will cause a fatality. And much like those executives and people at Ford, we need to make a decision that we are going to move forward and move to a design that is going to be safer for our patients so that we can deliver the care that we promised them. Without this design change, we are putting ourselves and our patients in jeopardy for really no reason. You know, if you look at these, these are very small. They probably don't cost very much. But if you don't understand human performance, you may overlook the fact that they are an error waiting to happen. So this is 10 years past that I've looked at Robin's picture, and I've looked at the picture of her son, who's now a 13-year-old. And I'm embarrassed to say that we haven't changed it yet. And what I'm hoping is that all of you will push for this change and no longer tolerate that we have unsafe design in our environment when we're trying to save our patients. I thank you for all of your help. Thanks for listening. For our expanded educational offerings, please go to the full catalog section of the Learn Something website or to www.ahrmm.org.